We're going to uh, begin our, our program this evening and uh, to welcome everyone to this dinner and to the conference. I'm pleased that we have with us tonight the Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, Ernest J. Wilson, and he will say a few words of greeting. Thank you, Phil. It's a, a pleasure to be here, um, especially at a gathering like this where you're talking about such an important topic, science. And I, maybe we could throw in science and technology. I, maybe that'll be something you'll talk about tomorrow, with whether or not we can include both of those terms, science and technology, um, and international affairs and conflict. It's hugely important. I am distinctly qualified to uh, deliver, to welcome you, because uh, I was taking my science class, and I think it was 1969. And uh, the administration at the time took that moment to invade some country or other, and they canceled, thank God, they canceled exams, final exams, when I was about to take my physics test. Um, and so that saved me from what no doubt would have been an embarrassing moment uh, when I got my physics grade back. But um, I, I have done a little bit of work uh, in science and technology since then. But um, we are, again, more seriously, delighted to have you here this evening. I know it's going to be a very rich discussion uh, over the next several days. Uh, we are a, plow a proud partner at the Annenberg School um, with the uh, college here at the university, and the two of us co-sponsor of the Center for Public Diplomacy, of which Phil Sieb is uh, the director. I should say something about Phil. Um, Phil is, I don't know how, I think he doesn't sleep, because every time I see him, he's just back from Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Washington or someplace else. And then every other week when he's not getting back, he is announcing the launch of his latest book. So it's really depressing for the rest of us who, you know, try to squeeze out an article every four years, and Phil is writing uh, book after book after book, and they're all good, Phil. Would you please stop this now? This is, uh, <laughs> but um, so on behalf of the center and, and the Annenberg School as a whole, I, I do want to, uh, to, to welcome you. I think that we um, operate, the center has operated for a number of years at the intersection of serious scholarly and intellectual analysis and work on the one hand, and a great concern for the, the needs of practitioners on the other. And so we're delighted to be here in LA. We have the, um, the Council General Corps with us. We have a number of people who come through on a regular basis from the UN, from the White House, from private companies, from NGOs, uh, to seek the advice of Phil and his colleagues at the Center for Public Diplomacy. Uh, let me just say a, a quick line or two about the Annenberg School. Uh, the full name is the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Uh, we pride ourselves on being uh, an innovative, full-service school in a networked university in the most global, diverse city in the United States. And by full service, we mean that we offer the gamut of resources, a BA degree, an MA degree, a PhD. We have 14 centers that provide mid-career training. We have um, public relations, journalism, public diplomacy, communications, four, four different varieties of communications. And I think that we are one of the few schools in the country that, in fact, provide that kind of integration all under one roof. So if you want to study the kinds of issues that we're going to be talking about tonight and tomorrow, then um, the Annenberg School can provide a lot of that under, under one roof. Um, at the heart of what we do is innovation and collaboration. And we are delighted to be able to, uh, as we kick off the Science Diplomacy Conference, to see that these two attributes, innovation on the one hand and collaboration on the other, are critical to the success of public diplomacy as well. At the core of this science diplomacy conference is a spirit of cooperation, collaboration, and innovation. In fact, as we were saying at dinner, you probably cannot get innovation if you don't collaborate. 
That's one of the important lessons I think we feel, especially in California, being at the edge of things, and that's where a lot of the innovation takes place, at the edge. Tomorrow, speakers and panelists will explore how scientists cooperate to prevent conflict. This is one of only a few gatherings that has addressed this critical and practical element of diplomacy. Very important topic, not enough attention devoted to it. I would like to recognize our co-sponsor for this event, the United States Institute of Peace. In particular, thanks to Sheldon Himmelfarb, the Associate Vice President of the Center for Science, Technology, and Peacebuilding at UICIP, who has been instrumental in developing uh, the conference program. In fact, if I could just have all of the USIP people raise their hand who are here and would like to welcome all of them. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's a great organization, and um, if you see me after the program, I will provide you tickets to the opening of the building when it opens. And, uh, it's uh, going to be a fabulous building that uh, uh, Richard has been working on for a number of years, and I urge all of you to to see this beautiful uh, structure. I also want to recognize the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Partnership for a Secure America, and the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation. These are among the NGOs who have worked diligently with the Center on Public Diplomacy to build this very important and substantive uh, program. From the USC community, I also want to uh, recognize some colleagues uh, the Annenberg's own Casey Cole, a professor in our School of Journalism and a longtime science writer. Uh, professor Cole, if you would raise your hand and stand and say hello. <coughs> uh, Casey is going to be one of our uh, uh, chairs of the panel tomorrow, and we certainly appreciate uh, her insight and her guidance. I think uh, Dean Yortsos is not here this evening, but he will be here tomorrow. He's my counterpart at the School of Engineering. And um, Giannis is an engineer's engineer, but ever since, Phil, you got him involved with this darn program, I keep getting emails, and he's sending me ways that we can soft power, hard power, and smart power. He is reduced to several engineering <laughs> equations. So we might ask him about that tomorrow uh, when, when we see him. Uh, and, of course, there are always countless people who do the really, really serious hard work behind the scenes to make everything work. And for this uh, Science Diplomacy Conference, they include Matthew Wallen, a Master of Public Diplomacy student who has been instrumental. And from the staff of the Center on Public Diplomacy, uh, Shireen Badawi Walton and Stacy Engber. Stacy, where are you? There's Stacy. Okay, in the back. They have been working for many, many months to make this happen. It is now my privilege to uh, turn the program over uh, to my distinguished colleague about whom I can, uh, since I cannot say enough that is good about him, I will stop right here and let him uh, take over the, the, the platform. Thanks, Phil, for all your, all your incredibly hard work on this. Well, thank you, Ernie, for, for taking time to join us uh, tonight, and, and I know that you are deeply interested in these topics, and we appreciate the commitment that uh, we've received from Annenberg to, to make, this, uh, make this conference happen. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight and through the day tomorrow about science diplomacy, and one of the things that we'll be addressing is what exactly is it? And uh, I'm sure our, our speaker tonight will have some thoughts on that, and we'll hear various definitions tomorrow. I'll give you just a shorthand version to ponder for the moment. Uh, that scientific cooperation and engagement designed to develop constructive relationships with foreign governments and publics. Now, that can be parsed in a number of ways. But I think the, the key element that we're going to be addressing at this conference is why is science such an important tool for diplomacy. And one of the reasons is that science is something that can transcend the politics of the moment. Science is not just about test tubes and particle accelerators, not just about university laboratories and space stations. Science is meant to serve humanity, bringing water to those who are thirsty, 
healing to those who are ill, and perhaps even peace to those whose lives have been scorched by conflict. So during this conference, we're going to be talking about diplomacy, a very political discipline, but exploring ways that diplomacy might be lifted to the higher levels of science. This is the kind of topic that USC's Center on Public Diplomacy likes to explore, going past the conventional elements of diplomacy, expanding the definition of public diplomacy beyond the realm of the State Department and foreign ministries around the world, and reaching instead for a concept that uses the triumphs of science, be they in communication or medic medicine or another field, to make diplomacy improve the lives of those whom it touches. And now to, to introduce our, our speaker. When uh, we were first beginning to organize uh, this conference and I was thinking about who would be a, uh, a good keynote speaker, I uh, called uh, David Baltimore, uh, the Nobel laureate and former president of Caltech, and he had one very brief message for me, get Vaughn Tarikian. And so we did. Um, Vaughn Tarikian is the director of the Center for Science Diplomacy at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in that position, his job is to reach out to the international science community. He has served in the US State Department and the National Academy of Sciences. And he brings to his work a passion born of understanding what science can do. That makes him a perfect person to begin this conference. So please join me in welcoming Vaughn Tarikian. Thank you so much, Phil. Actually, I think what uh, Professor Baltimore was saying was more of a get Vaughn, not a get Vaughn. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you so much, uh, Dean Wilson, for, uh, for this opening speech and opening discussion and, and hosting this here tonight. It's a real pleasure being here. I, I will say with a name like Tarikian, it's always nice to come to a place like uh, Southern California and USC because people don't look at you funny with a name. They think rather it's just normal, like Jones or Smith would be, that Tarikian is in fact the, uh, the Armenian equivalent. Um, it is really a great pleasure being here tonight. I, I'm reminded now that everyone's sort of having to look at me of a, of a, of a story of a post-dinner situation that took place when, in the Roman Empire when, uh, when the, the emperor was bringing a, a slave to, uh, to be taken in the Colosseum and brought him before, brought the slave before the, uh, the audience and was ready for a big festivity, a big, wonderful festivity for the Romans to celebrate. And so they brought the slave out into the center of the ring and they had brought up their biggest lions ready really to put on a great show. And so everyone was excited and everyone was enthusiastic. And the lions were released and the slave was sitting there terrified at first, staring at these lions about to make, a, about to make him the, uh, the evening meal. And right when the lions were about to come towards the, uh, towards the uh, slave, the slave whispered something very quickly. And the lions all turned around and walked away. And the emperor was so upset, but he was also so bemused by this that he thought, why, would, what could this person have done? So he, he called the slave up and he said, slave, come up here. I want to I hear about your wisdom. He said, what is it that you said to those lions that made these ferocious, hungry lions not want to eat their meal? And the slave said, I told them, after the dinner come the speeches. So with that, I will begin my speech. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, to not only be here with uh, colleagues from, uh, from Washington, D.C., who, yes, I think are thinking about being in 65 degree weather at a time when it's about to become two feet of snow in Washington, but also to be here and discuss this important topic. We, Dean Wilson, as I mentioned, it's a real pleasure to be here. And Phil, thank you so much. And to the, to the diplomatic community that's here, it's, a, it's also a great honor that you would come to, to this type of a conversation to hear me. I, I think it's actually, when I hear what the agenda is gonna be for tomorrow, I can actually say that this is a conference that's only gonna get better as the days go by. Um, so, Talking about this issue of science diplomacy, I, I think I'm going to just hit some, some key points here and then, then see where we are. And, and I would really, in sort of a scientific mindset, go through some of my talk, but really 
at the end hope to have some some questions and answers and really discussion because I think it is such an interesting concept and one that people here are thinking about all the time that it's actually really nice to to have that interaction but but I will say that I think we really are seeing the emergence of what is a new era of science diplomacy and I think you'll hear why I think it's a new era of science diplomacy coming up soon um, it's a new era that has many different players with many different backgrounds there are people in the public diplomacy community, as we've seen here. There are scientists, there are non-governmental organizations, there are universities, there's foundations, there's governments. All of these communities are playing in this new era for science diplomacy. And the argument that I think a number of us make is that the time is actually right for science diplomacy, that this is actually the right time to actually really accelerate and enhance what we are calling science diplomacy. Um, We've seen in many ways and in many examples the limits of hard power, or what people have called hard power. And even traditional elements of what others have called soft power or smart power are also seeming to be waning in many ways. The economic slowdown, the, uh, the resistance in some parts to US cultural icons that we've often held as being very valuable pieces of our smart power or outgoing public diplomacy is actually becoming more and more obvious. And we are also in a multipolar world with coalitions being built around interests and issues rather than everybody just looking to one side or another. Um, in addition, in talking about science diplomacy, near, the, we are at a time where nearly every major issue, and I, I really think this is true, that nearly every major issue, both global and national in scale, have science or technology, Dean Wilson, both science or technology, as either their underlying cause or cure. And I think that is really an important time that we exist in. And that's part of the raison d'etre for science as a whole enterprise. And over the past few years, there have been many lessons learned, experiences and identification of possible paths forward in science diplomacy. And I hope to touch on those, but also to, to learn here from, the, from what people think. So let's start with some basic context. The US is, and, and really for the foreseeable future in science, will continue to be I would say the major scientific center in the world. We have, we spend the most money on science, we have the most scientists um, in terms of major sort of research capacity and research areas. We also have more publications in top journals from the US scientific community and than any other country. And our research universities, places like USC, places like many of the, the organizations where a number of you are from, are really preeminent in the world in terms of being top rank research universities. And that's important. That's a very attractive power. But this lead, if you want to call it that, is decreasing. And it's, you know, not unexpected in many ways. As most of the world and many parts of the world that we think about on a daily basis are realizing that the central role of science and technology and investments in science and their discoveries and their applications are playing in increasing not only economic growth, but societal well-being. This is really something that is quite obvious and quite telling when we travel, is that countries are investing on their own in science and technology. And we're seeing that at a much more globalized level, there's a globalized technical workforce that's developing, with countries taking greater steps and really inducing greater incentives to attract talent not only of their diaspora, but really reaching out to other countries to try to pull their best people. This is a time of great competition in the scientific community. So contextually, all over the world, science is becoming more embedded into the way that societies act and societies interact with each other. And that valued activity is focused on the community that we're discussing today. So now let's turn to one of the things that Phil mentioned we might discuss, is this issue of what is science diplomacy? Well, Two words, science and diplomacy, often don't like to come together very often. But, but when you do bring them together and you don't get fights in the room, you can actually think about the merging of those two terms in different ways. And they mean different things and have different applications. So let's start with this issue of science in diplomacy. In many ways, when we talk about science in diplomacy, we're really talking about how science can help identify and underpin many of the global issues that we think about how it can help identify some of the foreign policy issues we think about. So climate change is a big issue at foreign policy levels. Underpinning science, uh, underpinning climate change, both its understanding and its solution, is science. So the foreign policy community likes to get and embed science in some ways into some of its decision making. That's science in diplomacy. There are other examples as well. There are great examples of diplomacy for science. When the science community is looking to help access 
or to have the ability to put together some big programs internationally. And they really need to have access to other countries working together. So what do they do? They often will turn to the diplomatic community to help smooth those, those waters and to help build those bridges, but to help address a scientific issue. And I think about this thing called ITER, which I was involved in a little bit, which is the which is actually called ITER, but at one time was called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which brought together a number of countries to try to work on a really important scientific question of fusion, Can you about uh, fusion research. And it really required the diplomatic community helping work with the science community to help move that along. Then there's this issue of, diplomacy, of science for diplomacy, or science diplomacy, which is where I'll spend most of my time, and which Phil mentioned, which we have loosely defined as the application of international science cooperation motivated by the desire to establish or enhance relationship between, relationships between societies. And to do so, science diplomacy requires bringing together two communities that, as I mentioned, don't often talk to one another. I was trained as a scientist, and I will say that when I worked internationally, the one thing that I was always looking for working internationally was the issue of access. I wanted to have access to counterparts. I wanted to have access to their ideas. I wanted to have access to their samples or to samples in some of these countries. I wanted to have access in some ways to some of their funding. I wanted to have access to equipment or machinery that my lab did not have. So I was driven internationally by wanting to have access. And that in many ways is what the scientific community thinks about when they think about international science cooperation is access to things. Um, they also have another community, which is the foreign policy community. And the question there is, what do they want by, from international science cooperation? Well, a little bit of access. Foreign policy people want to have access to some of the people that are scientists and therefore influential. But more importantly, they want to have influence. Diplomats and foreign policy community want to have influence over the way that countries might make decisions. They want to have influence over the way that countries develop. And, as is appropriate for this community, they want to have influence over the way that publics view their country, the public diplomacy piece. So in many ways, when we think about science diplomacy, we are bringing together the scientist's desire for access and the diplomat's desire for, for, uh, for influence into one community here. And that overlap, in many ways, is that nexus that is science diplomacy. So one way to look at science diplomacy is that it sits at the intersection of the access and influence, science and foreign policy. This is a paradigm that we have been thinking about and are happy to discuss, or I've been thinking about with my colleagues at AAAS and other places, happy to discuss, maybe less happy to defend, but would be happy to do so after this, if, as long as people have had their dessert and are feeling full before throwing anything at my direction, Stu. Um, <laughs> so science diplomacy focuses on, we think about three important outcomes, or three important things. And one of the areas that we think about is that science diplomacy, and I think Sheldon actually mentioned this at one of the, Sheldon Himmelfarb mentioned this at one of the conferences we held at AAAS, which is that science diplomacy can help build the infrastructure for relationships between countries. It's an important piece. Another thing that science diplomacy can do, or science in the diplomatic world, and, and Stu and I have been involved in some of this, and he'll describe some of this, I think, tomorrow, is as a pilot light. Keeping the pilot light of a relationship burning, even when everything else is extinguished. And the other one from the science community is the reason for science diplomacy is it really keeps, allows scientists in places that might not have a lot of access to the rest of the world, it keeps them involved and keeps them engaged. And I've had colleagues of mine who have worked immediately after the end of the, or one of the ends of the Iraq war, and said that one of the most important things that they did through their science diplomacy activities were just to keep some of the Iraqi scientists who didn't have a lot of connections and activities connected. And that was so important for them as scientists. No other agenda, really, to keep the scientific community going. The U.S. has actually a, a history of science diplomacy. And the reason why I mentioned in my opening that this is a new era for science diplomacy is because there was an old era for science diplomacy. In many ways, that was focused on the Cold War period. Now, I'll, I'll quickly run through three examples that I think are somewhat uh, indicative of the, of the, or emblematic of the types of things that we can think about now. And the first one that most people don't think about, interestingly enough, is that the U.S. and Japan had one of the earliest science diplomacy relationships. It actually came originally when the foreign policy community in the, in the form of, a, of soon to be, when we became ambassador Edwin Reischauer, wrote a book called Fixing the Broken Dialogue with Japan. 
At that time, in the late 1950s, the US and the Japanese governments were interacting with each other, but there was a broken dialogue that was, that was highlighted in the in Foreign Policy Journal that said that the two societies are not interacting with one another. The academic communities, the intellectual elites, were not interacting with each other very much, and there was a lot of concern that that would lead to a drift, that you'd begin to lose the Japanese and the US connection over time. And there was, of course, the concern about, about the Japanese falling potentially into a communist sphere. And so there was a concern about that. So when President Kennedy made Ambassador Reichauer his ambassador in, to, to Tokyo, one of the things that they thought about was how do you better link these things up? How do you actually bring these communities together more? When Prime Minister Ikeda came to Washington, D.C. for his first visit to President Kennedy, the two of them decided that there had to be more people-to-people -people exchanges. And that led directly to the National Science Foundation and the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science working together in a memorandum of cooperation that could bring together their scientific communities to fund projects to get moving. Well, the U.S. scientific community was so far ahead of the Japanese science community at that point. The U.S. had been, you know, a little bit past, but it had not been too far past, winning the major war through use of science and technology, and the Japanese were a defeated power. What could scientists possibly work on at that point? Well, at the end of the day, one of my colleagues, who was actually the, very fir the first NSF director in Tokyo, said that they found little projects at first, little things where they could identify some good things to go forward, facilitated those, funded those, moved forward, got going, and built a whole program around it. I was in Tokyo, actually, in 2008, when the Nobel Prize in Physics was given to two Japanese physicists and a Japanese-American physicist. And in many ways, it is the capstone and a demonstration that over time, science collaboration, science cooperation, that were meant to bring countries together, also resulted in pretty good science. The second example is one that I think people do think of, which is the U.S. and China example, which was when President Nixon went over to, to sort of the, the Nixon goes to China moment. One of the things to think about was how do we move this relationship beyond just being the geopolitical relationship? How do you actually bridge a divide that had stood for so long and bring people together? Well, if you look at the Shanghai communique, the Shanghai communique had as a critical element not only the issue of what to do about the, uh, the China and Taiwan issue, but a critical element of it was to increase the amount of exchanges in science and academic exchanges. And science became embedded in the relationship between the U.S. and China. And so in 1979, when President um, Carter first came to power in January, when we normalized relationships with the Chinese, one of the keystone pieces was the signing of a science and technology cooperation agreement as an example of the normalization of the relationships. The third example is the one that's, I think, probably the best known is the U.S. and Soviet Union throughout the Cold War and the role of science as really the pilot light, keeping a relationship going at some level, even when everything else was not possible. And I think one of the best quotes was actually when then Assistant Secretary of Oceans, Environment, and Science in the State Department, who became Deputy Secretary of State Ambassador Negroponte, was asked about this question of the U.S.-Soviet scientific exchanges in a congressional testimony. And he said, and I quote, we cannot forget that we are dealing with a closed society and that these exchanges often give us the only access to significant circles in that society with whom we would otherwise have little or no contact. It would be short-sighted of us not to recognize that it is in our national interest to seek and expand science cooperation with the Soviet Union. At that point, and this was the late 80s, he was giving the, the reason d'etre for, raison d'etre for going forward, even when people didn't understand why would the U.S. And this, even think about giving any scientific collaboration with then the enemy, the Soviet Union. So why science diplomacy now? So this is the past, but why science diplomacy now? Well, as I mentioned, we are at a pivotal point where U.S. soft power is dwindling, especially in many parts of the broader Middle East and North Africa. The public view, though, generally of science and U.S. science is much more positive, and people think about um, a lot of the polling data, and I think if you look at the Pew polling and the Zogby polling that took place, generally speaking, it's quite obvious that even while there was a general uh, negative attitudes towards much of the U.S. society in many parts of the world, the, the respect for U.S. science and scientists and engineers 
remains at extremely high levels, higher than actually for other countries, but higher than any other segment of the U.S. society. And that's actually a very important thing. And there are a lot of statistics. One need to look at the Zogby polling, which looked at Arab views of the U.S. And in a place like Saudi Arabia in 2004, where 4 percent of the population actually approved of the United States, over 48 percent had a favorable view towards U.S. science. And the other numbers in the United Arab Emirates and other places are, are obvious as well. There are a lot of other examples where countries are beginning to think about this outside of the United States. And the Royal Society in the UK just put together a conference in June, which AAAS, my organization, worked on, on science diplomacy as a broader concept and brought together a lot of experts from around the world to talk about these issues of science diplomacy. In the United States, President Obama, during his Cairo speech, had as one of his key deliverables, in fact, what we would call science diplomacy. He set up science envoys lead scientists in the United States, not associated with the government, who would go out to various parts of the broader Middle East, North Africa, and the other, and, and Southeast Asia, and help bring science communication, science activities, as a key point of U.S. engagement with the world. So when we think about, in fact, our own experiences suggest that the countries that are interested in this are actually growing over and over. And Japan has come forward with a number of science diplomacy initiatives, and others as well. So as we go forward, we're thinking about things, and I think Phil mentioned that the Partnership for Secure America, later this week or next week, they'll be releasing a report which will include not only scientists, or a statement not only scientists, but critically members of the, key members of the U.S. Uh, national security community to talk about the important role of science and international science cooperation in the United States. It also includes a number of scientists who are saying this is an important thing to do. The U.S. government recognized science diplomacy, as I mentioned, in the Cairo speech. And at AAAS, my organization, we actually have started to do a number of different things around science diplomacy. First is we started a center for science diplomacy, which is based upon the idea that scientists working with each other can really make a difference in these areas. And I'm the director of the center, and we continue to try to evolve the types of things we do and the types of activities we undertake. But we are driven by three core functions. We call them, there's the inspirational, the operational, and the intellectual. And inspirationally, we go, especially in Washington, D.C., and try to demonstrate the value of science as a diplomatic tool, as science in bringing together societies. Operationally, we've taken a number of different visits. And in fact, I mentioned the one that Stu and I were on, where the president of our association, Peter Agre, who's a Nobel Prize winner, went to North Korea and visited some of our colleagues and some counterparts in the State Academy of Sciences to see if there are potential areas of cooperation. I went with Dr. Agre to Cuba in November to meet with counterparts and to see if there are areas where, even while the political relationship evolves, there might be ways for our scientists to interact with each other along areas of mutual interest and mutual benefit. Earlier, and sorry, not, this is not just sort of a statement of all the places I've gone in the world, but there's some relevance. Earlier this year, or last year, I was in March, I went with Professor Baltimore, which is maybe why he said, get Vaughn, um, <laughs> but because I think I stepped out on a barbell. Um, we went to Syria, and one of the things there was to actually figure out if as the Obama administration was thinking about a new relationship with Syria politically, are there ways that the scientific community can work together to help either provide that scaffolding or that infrastructure or just provide a demonstration of what's possible. So we think that those different areas are important. But the third area, which is sort of the last, is the intellectual, which Stuart Thorson and I had a conversation about earlier today, which is really getting the academic community, the universities, to really begin to provide intellectual input into the issues of science diplomacy. What are the major issues? What are the barriers? What are the metrics for success? We've had some thoughts about types of issues that could be raised, like the issue of the role of science cooperation to help enhance regional integration. The European Union is a great example of this, where science was actually critical to bring together Europe after World War II. There are other examples. We have the former minister, from, uh, minister of Science Technology from Rwanda working in our center right now, and he's interested in the role that science cooperation can play as they develop, as East Africa tries to develop the East African community, and think about all the different pieces, but science and academic exchanges throughout Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda might actually serve as a great way to build intellectual capital 
and that sharing scientific data on the Nile River can help better understand these things, that science can underpin many of what people want to go forward with. This week, we, we welcomed to AAAS a new Syrian Science Diplomacy Fellow following up on our visit. And she's really going to be working with the scientific and the academic community to see if there are places and ways that Syria and the United States in our academic ways can enhance a relationship through science cooperation. And there are many other ways, and we look forward to talking to people about things that we might do, but also ways that we might contribute to activities. You know, in closing, I'm going to say that there are a number of lessons learned from, I think, from the U.S. and from our experience about science diplomacy. Number one is governments have an important role to play, but in fact, they need not lead everything. In fact, civil society has a central role in all of these things, universities particularly, but science organizations, foundations, and others. The conversations we have with other countries on these issues have to be of mutual benefit. And mutual benefit meaning not only that they have societal benefit, but really it's got to be based on the best science possible. That's the example, that's the lesson we learned from the Japan example, in fact, was when you rewarded the best science in, a, in an area, you actually could get very good science and you could build it. And it wasn't political, it was scientific. Um, science cooperation and science and development are very different. Science cooperation is actually scientist to scientist. Development is actually trying to do development work, and we try to keep those things separate. Having outside non-governmental groups, like foundations, fund activities, really is beneficial. It helps us out a lot that we can go to places and say, we're not using government money when we're trying to engage with places. This is actually civil society interested in this, and that makes a big difference. But critically, it does require bringing together the foreign policy and the science community. And when that happens, you actually do get the nexus of two very important communities in the United States who are thinking about ways all the time to change relationships, to build relationships, and to think about innovative approaches. So on that part, I'm just going to finish up now because I think that it's, it's really a, hopefully a good place to start this week's or the, next, the conference over the next few days. But more than anything, over time, we at AAAS, I know people that are thinking about science diplomacy as a whole, need more people involved in it more people engaged in it, and more people providing their guidance, their thoughts, their observations, and their really recommendations on what we do and what we don't do. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, I hope I didn't drone on too long late at night. I could tell the Washington folks are thinking, man, it's 11 o'clock at night my time, but <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully this was helpful and, and, and useful. So thank you so much. So yeah, so there are definitely some questions. I don't know if there's a mic or a hands or. Oh, okay. My question's directed towards uh, science in the healthcare field. Um, in terms of cooperation with countries, for example, that might need certain drugs or medical devices, um, how does your organization or in general science diplomacy address that because of all the patenting issues and in terms of cooperation between corporate corporations such as Pfizer or other big medical companies that need to assist these companies instead of government just putting money and saying, hey, we have an epidemic, okay, here's the government that allocates a certain amount of money and then gives it to the country for them to develop it. If we have the technologies on our behalf, how do we uh, sort of lend a hand without uh, getting all the corporations riled up and whatnot? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question, and I will say one of the interesting experiences about our time in Cuba when we visited was that it was very clear that the issue of medical diplomacy in its broadest field was actually a, it was central to their, their objectives in foreign policy. And so I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question, but then I'll first give a, a, another this example of the Cuba example, which was after Hurricane Mitch, I think the Castro administration at the time decided that medical diplomacy healthcare delivery, doctor training, was going to be central to the way that they were going to build bridges and build links to Latin America as a whole, but Central America specifically. From that, they evolved a number of different activities, including an entire university or school for medicine, which they tried to train medical professionals and healthcare providers to do this, to either bring them in from Latin America, now more globally, or to send out trained expertise. 
one of the pieces, and, and I think it, this is a critical element for what we think about in science diplomacy, is to first provide the, the playing field for the demonstration of concept that science cooperation and science technology and medical cooperation has a value that helps not only the technical community, but also does have a diplomatic and national security piece that's very valuable that in the sense that you're raising the profile of the United States, public diplomacy, uh, diplomatic purposes, and that's very, very important. The one thing, though, is, and I, we do emphasize this from our standpoint, from AAAS, is that one of the key elements of this is actually working with countries and building scientific capacity, not treating it as science and technology transfer as in, in more of a development context, which is other people actually have much more expertise, much more credibility than we do. But if we can help work closely with scientific communities so that they can develop their own capacity, their own connections to the U.S. scientific community that over time can help them develop drugs. So the example of Syria is actually very interesting. Syria actually is one of the largest fabricators of vaccines. They don't do any of their own research and development. And the woman that's actually come to the AAAS as a science diplomacy fellow is a biomedical scientist. We actually got her PhD in, in, in New Mexico in biomedical sciences. And one of the things I asked her, I said, what would you like to see from the Syrian science community? And her comment was, we need to move from making the drugs to creating the drugs. And that requires research and development. And one of the key ways we would like to work with the United States and others, but particularly the United States in this case, is to develop those links university to university, researcher to researcher, to really develop the knowledge base and the connections and the methodologies that can help us become the producers, not only the producers, but the creators of these drugs, vaccines, and other things as well. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. <laughs> The, the, the man with the microphone has the power here. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, you hear from my accent, I'm from Germany. Uh, I, I agree with most of what you said, but my first statement is to Professor Saib. He said at the beginning, science is there to serve humanity. He's a good man if he thinks that is the only reason for science. If you speak to some of the pure scientists, they don't care about serve humanity. They are scientists because they would like to find out something, to discover something, to do something, and serve humanity is a side effect perhaps, but not for all scientists. This is a prime goal, serve humanity. My question I, I, I is... Would say, I, I would agree with you. I would say that there's a difference between scientists and science. And I, I, I would say that as a, when I was doing my research in a long time ago. I was probably not thinking at the time about how is this going to serve humanity. I'm not sure that my research actually would have any impact on humanity, but I do think that the collective information that science can provide, that science underpins the solutions or the causes of many of the issues, or most of the issues that humanity and societies face. Yeah, but my, my, my question is, um, since I'm a, a bureaucrat, a, a pen pusher. I depend on experts when it comes to make decisions. Mm -hmm. For example, I worked many years ago in the arms control section or disarmament. And to understand what's going on when you build nuclear weapons or when you dismantle nuclear weapons, I need to know what the science, the, the, the physics tell, tells me and so on. So uh, one, one additional moment for science diplomacy, I would say, is to create trust at, uh, at the level of the decision makers, because they don't know uh, unless they, they trust what the experts say is feasible or not feasible. That, uh, that is, to me, a very important element why I'm interested in science. I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I would say I went into the State Department first as a scientist, I came in under the program called the AAAS Science Diplomacy Fellowship. And I always thought that the two things that it did, more than anything else, was it helped first show young scientists the world of diplomacy. Ah, this is interesting, policy. But more importantly, it actually built the trust. Because 
I would say for the most part, we were pretty hardworking, had expertise that was useful. And we're able to demonstrate to, at that point, policymakers and decision leaders that scientists weren't just people with t test tubes and beakers sitting in their corner, not interested in the world around them, but actually could communicate, could write, could take their points of view and get it across quite succinctly, dispassionately if we needed to, but with accuracy and truth. And that trust that built up, not by my cohort, but over a 30-year program, actually has helped I think the foreign policy community in the United States feel greater trust that they could turn to scientists who are not totally disconnected, but also have an expertise that could be useful and is not being sent out there with passion or prejudice. Thank you. Um, I'm Maya Cross from the School of Sorry. IR in Annenberg, <laughs> and I really enjoyed your, your talk. I, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering if you could disaggregate science, um, and in particular, do you find that in certain areas of science it's easier to collaborate or cooperate across countries? And the second question, which is a follow-on to this, is whether it, you, th you think it would be useful to try to break boundaries in terms of scientific collaboration. I'm thinking of areas where countries don't actually want to share scientific knowledge that they have, particularly uh, military scientific knowledge. Uh, nonetheless, do you think that that's where science diplomacy should focus to, to try to overcome those hurdles to be more effective? Yeah, these are great questions. Let me, let me start with the first part, which is disaggregating what we mean by science. I, I come from an organization, so my bias is we are a general scientific society, which means that we don't view science in one particular field. We rather say that it's everything from anthropology to zoology and everything in between. I think we even have a dentist in the audience tonight, and we actually have a sent, uh, section on dentistry. I say that because we think, that I believe that the issue of social sciences is central to the, a lot of the issues that we discuss when we talk about science diplomacy and science in general, as well as the physical, biological, um, and natural sciences. In fact, when I think about the new era for science diplomacy, one of the things that is interesting about it is I think the nature of the fields that we're covering are quite different. I think that when you think about what was happening with the US and the Soviets, it tended to be in one set of fields for the most part. Now the range of fields are so wide because it's so dependent upon where you're working. There is need for the physicists, and they've got a tremendous history of working together on big programs and big projects. I think we're going to hear about Sesame as a really fantastic example of science bringing together different parts of the world. But there are also areas of environment, shared boundaries, shared borders, environmental conservation, water use. That's another sort of broad areas of things. But also decision science, management science. How do you actually take some of these scientific the scientific information and turn it into the way in which people make decisions. That whole community comes together. The issue of civil science versus military science and the role of science diplomacy. We actually, because we're, we believe in civil research, I mean that's sort of our, where we exist because the community that we represent oftentimes are academics, universities, and others. But the basic sort of underpinning of what we believe is the scientific method, transparency, peer review, meritocracy, data sharing. Over and over again, these are the messages we send out when we say this is what the scientific community and scientific cooperation requires. It meets many other fields, many other groups say, wouldn't it be great if we had more transparency in something? Well, in science, you need transparency. It's the basis of what we do. Data sharing is central to anything. Any, you can't have a collaboration with somebody if they won't share their data. Meritocracy is so important to actually ensuring that what's getting funded is not based upon political priorities, but based upon making sure the best of what is out there is getting funded. And peer review, that, is, that underpins, and it actually speaks to all of these, underpins everything that the scientific community has to think about. That if it can't pass peers looking at it and judging something, then really it's very difficult. It might be fantastic science, but it doesn't meet the scientific method. Herman, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> Vaughn, thank you for mentioning Sesame, which I'll talk about tomorrow <laughs> and get people aware. But Iran is a member of Sesame, 
And as you pointed out, uh, relations, U.S.-Soviet Union relations, we had diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. We don't with Iran. So scientific communication is even more important, you might say, there as a vehicle. Um, a few weeks ago, a physicist was murdered in Iran. Um, I'm very pleased that the American Physical Society has written to the appropriate governmental authorities in Iran expressing deep concern and sympathy. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if the AAAS has done anything or what your suggestions are for how the scientific community should react to this. It's widely regarded that yeah. it's the regime that did it. I mean, even though they accused the United States and Israel as a knee-jerk reaction. Right. We, we actually don't have an official <coughs> made any official statement one way or the other on this, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question and one that we have discussed that really anything that's done in our view that's meant to mute a scientist or science as a whole is very much against what we would think is a scientific method, right? I mean, the whole idea is to ensure that science is out there. Now, one of the things, and I know that we've had I don't know if I've had this conversation with you, but one of the things that we've recommended to people is it does provide an important lesson that scientists are not completely separate from society. As much as a scientist might think that their research is separate or they're in their own lab, in fact, you are, by definition, part of society. You're in, you're in the operating of society. I thought that, and this might be a challenge back to you, that talking to Bruce Alberts, the editor-in-chief of Science Magazine, and putting together an editorial that raises not only the issue of what happened, but the importance on the positive side that something like Sesame, particularly at a time when a number of science envoys have been going around to the different parts of the world to promote co cooperation in science, could be very valuable to raise the profile of something not only like Sesame, but Sesame is the idea that you just mentioned of bringing together scientists to work on science problems, and that any time the politics gets involved in that in a negative way, it not only hurts the science enterprise, but it also does have impact on the way that societies interact with each other. So my challenge back to you and, and the APS colleagues, and I've, I'm going to see Cherry Murray next week, I think, or in two weeks, is that this might be a great opportunity to reach out not only to the science community on this, but other communities as well about the importance of these types of activities. Did I dance fast enough? <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is something we. It is something that we have thought about, and, and would be very interested in what your thoughts are as both a leader in Sesame, but also somebody who's been involved in a lot of these activities for a long period of time. Thank you. Um, I'm Naomi Light. I'm a master's candidate in um, the public diplomacy program here at USC. And my question is that um, it's your science, science diplomacy is mainly focused on exchanges between scientists, but you also briefly mentioned the impact of, of civil society. And I wanted to know if um, on the trips and the travels you've done with different science exchanges, how the scientists actually interact with the publics they're working at. So foreign publics, let's say in Cuba or um, in Iran or anywhere else there are science diplomacy exchanges going on, how does that impact actual publics, the civil society in the communities you're working in? Thank you. So how, how do our exchanges or our interactions affect the publics or how do how does science in those countries affect the publics? Both. What, what has, has your experience been? Okay. Well, it's, one of the things that's, and I think I mentioned it early on, is that one of the things we're seeing more and more is that, that countries, not only the ones you just mentioned, but, but many of the countries that we visit, really are looking to science and scientists as a key element and underpinning their broader growth. I mean, that's, that's a big piece. So one of the areas where we work very hard as an organization and have built many linkages to, to others or built many links to many other uh, colleagues internationally is this idea of public engagement. Public engagement is actually a very different term for scientists. For very often, scientists, and I would say having been the son of a professor, uh, who's been a professor for many, many years, public engagement was, I'm going to stand up here and tell you what the science says, and if you can't get it, that's your problem. Okay, public engagement in 
the AAAS community, and more broadly, I think, in the science community now, is that it's got to be a dialogue. And so I'm, I'm going to turn this question a little bit, that we see this issue very much in the United States. A lot of the issues that are important politically, that have science underpinning, <coughs> when decisions aren't made a certain way, it doesn't have to do with the fact that people don't understand the issue. It's they might not like it. And they may not like the implications of certain things. So the example of stem cells is a great example. It's an example where it's not, you know, scientists getting up there and just saying, no, but you don't understand. You don't understand, public. Let me tell you about this one more time. Oftentimes the public is saying, yeah, we do understand what this is. And if we believe certain things, we don't like it. If we believe other things, we do like it. So one of the key pieces for an organization like AAAS, but AAAS working with our, our international counterparts is, we've got to get the public into a dialogue and into a public engagement that's not top-down or unidirectional. We've got to understand as scientists, because ultimately, science is funded for the most part by publics. The value and the, the potential problems, but the potential possibilities of science, and that's an ongoing conversation. One of the things we also have, and again, this is not an advertisement for AAAS, though it might sound like one, but is a dialogue on science, ethics, and religion. And this is really at the core. How do you get scientists and religious leaders just even in the same room together to talk about things that they might not look at the same way? Evolution. But actually just getting people to understand or begin to have that conversation more and more. So that's one of the ways. You know, one of the things we try to do when we go internationally also is to do a lot of outreach through the media, particularly when we bring somebody like a Nobel Prize winner who has still very high levels of respect in most publics to show not only that we're there and that we're interested in working, but that we greatly value the pride and collaboration, or pride that a country's science community might be there. I, I will say, when a Nobel Prize winner goes to a country that might not be quite as developed scientifically and says, you know, I'm here because I think there's really good science here and there are things we can work on. That not only reaches the scientific community, the pride that people who feel great pride in their country have towards that is amazing. And one of the examples, and, and Herman, I think you might know of this one, is when the National Academy of Sciences, which has done a lot of exchanges with, um, with Iran <coughs> in science, brought a Nobel Prize winner, Joe Taylor, to uh, Sharif University. Joe Taylor gave a lecture, a packed room, a full house. They afterwards decided that they wanted to build a statue. I mean, this was three years ago, two years ago. A statue of Professor Taylor to put up there in a prominent position because they were so pleased that this very well-known and very, very well-respected Nobel Prize winner not only came and spoke to scientists and academics, but was there in the first place to recognize that the Iranian culture is very, very advanced in many areas of science, and this was a sign of, of mutual interest and mutual trust. Hi, my name is Yael Swerdlow. I'm the consular liaison and graduate of the Master's in Public Diplomacy program. I'm wondering how science diplomacy handles um, proposed boycotts of different countries. You know, it's a, in, in what, can, I think I know what you're getting at, but could bring the, <laughs> do you have any specific examples? Um, well, I, I, yeah, actually, the proposed Israeli, the boycott of yeah. the Israeli scientists by the Brits. Yeah. You know, we, this is not even a science diplomacy question so much as it's, again, I'll speak on, for the AAA standpoint, we, we strongly believe that science is based upon the free flow of information and of people. That is a fundamental pretense. We are not governmental, so it's easy for, easier for us to say that, but that you, you really have to have an exchange of people and an exchange of their ideas. And this is, it's central to the scientific method. The scientific method requires that people are exchanging information, exchanging data, putting it out there transparently. I mean, that's the other piece of it. It's not taking it and sequestering it someplace and hiding it and using it for something else, but really doing this in a way that doesn't penalize the scientific community for doing things. I mean, it's not meant to sound Pollyannish. I mean, there obviously, all of this is embedded into a political world in which we live. But we, as a scientific organization, have to believe that, that scientists need to interact with each other because 
that helps advance science and we believe serves society. I think in that case, we actually came out, and, I'm, and I, I'm not positive either, a board statement on this, a board of directors made a statement on this, um, concerned about, about the, uh, the boycott that was taking place, or it was a letter that came out. I can't remember, I mean, in our bureaucratic structure, there's sort of different things of who signs what. <laughs> and, and in this case, I think we either came out with a letter of concern about this or, or made some statement more officially as the organization. But you know, for example, I mean, I, the AAA's board of directors has made statements about the the embargo against Cuba related to science, not related to other things, because that that's not our lane. Our lane is that the embargo is actually hurting scientific exchanges, and that as we should keep science out of that political arena, and it's important for scientists to continue to interact with each other. Since I've got the microphone, I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, last, okay, last one. I'm last told. question, I promise. Yeah, I've, um, I'm, I'm trying to, we're, we're racing the snow uh, back to Washington. No, it's okay, please. Okay. Um, a number of us last year were in a, I'm sorry, I'm in, a, in the Master's in Public Diplomacy program, and a number of us last year were in a class on transnational diplomacy and global security. And one of the more provocative articles we read was by a constructivist scholar named Thomas Rissa, I believe, uh, although my colleagues can jump in if, I'm, if I've got the author wrong. And he basically argued that it was science diplomacy through nuclear physicists who basically ended the Cold War um, through the exchange of ideas. And I'm curious if you ascribe to that viewpoint um, and you could speak a little more uh, upon its behalf because a number of us realist scholars kind of disagreed. But uh, given the, the, the science diplomacy side of this, I'm curious if you could um, uh, back up that viewpoint. I, I can say that I was not around during... The, well, I was around. I was around. But I was not sort of maybe enlightened at that point to know. I've, I've heard these arguments before. My father was actually on some of the early exchanges that took place with the, with the Soviet scientists and U.S. scientists. And I think more than anything else, he would say that one of the things it did was it created very close connections and links with people and scientists that after the fall of the Soviet Union, when people were trying to figure out a lot of other things, the scientific communities could, because they had built a level of trust and knowledge of each other, could continue to work even seamlessly as things were in transition. Others might be more expert. I mean, there. There are a lot of, a lot of theories on, on things. One of the things it does say, though, is, and I think this is, this is a truth, is that scientists in the Soviet Union had a very high level of respect. And they were very influential. And so they were among the best scientists in the world. And I think the American scientific community knew that. I think the Soviet and Russian scientific community also was able to report back that the American scientific community was pretty far advanced and doing pretty well. And the fact that you had communities that were influential in their own countries was probably very helpful in ensuring communication within the policymaking structure. Now, does anybody else want to add to that provocative argument? Because there have been some even more provocative statements about that, about direct reasons for things. But with that, I thank you so much, and I really appreciate this. And I do apologize that I'm, I am going to not be here. I I'd hope to stay. I have a nine-month-old daughter who is uh, actually I have a, a wife who's informing my nine-month-old daughter needs her daddy back. So, uh, so I'll be heading home for that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vaughn. Uh, I think that's a, a great start to our uh, to our conference, raising a lot of issues that we're going to be addressing uh, throughout the day tomorrow. In fact, this whole Cold War uh, question is going to be discussed uh, with Kip Thorne of uh, Caltech uh, during our lunch uh, session tomorrow, a conversation with Nick Cole of, of USC just talking about what was going on amongst the, uh, the American and the Soviet scientists. Thank you all again for coming tonight. Tomorrow we get started. Our first session begins at 9. Uh, there will be continental breakfast available beginning at 8.30. This building on the second floor. And we hope to see all of you tomorrow. Thanks again for coming.